in hot at Mississippi, surrounded by four walls that ain't so pretty. His parents give him love and affection to keep him strong, moving in the right direction, living just enough, just enough for the city. For 14 hours And you can bet He barely makes a dollar His mother goes To scrub the floors For many And you best believe She hardly gets a pity Living just enough Just enough For the city Welcome. On behalf of the Departments of History and African American and African Studies, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for Who Cities? Cultural Approaches to Suburban Studies and Race with Mary Rizzo and Kyle Reismandel. Today's event is part of the programming for FAM Week, an initiative launched two years ago to showcase the value of a major minor in African American and African Studies which we're putting that link in the chat. <laughs> uh, it really is to present students with the opportunities to learn more about our world-class faculty, interdisciplinary course offerings and career pathways. And if you're a Rutgers Newark student interested in how an African-American and African studies or history major or minor could work with your current plans, please add your name and email address in the chat and I'll be sure to follow up with you. So just to check our dedicated page at SASN rutgers.edu FM week for more information and the events calendar. Before we meet our guests, a few very brief notes. This event is being recorded for our archive and closed captioning is enabled. 
To view, please click on the closed caption CC button at the bottom of the Zoom screen to display the subtitles or to view the full transcript. To keep our virtual space secure and ensure that this can be a comfortable experience for all of us, we adjusted our program a bit to a webinar with chat messages only visible to panelists. But we still want you to actively engage with us and hope that you will enter questions or comments in the Q&A box and we will answer as many live as time allows. Now, let's meet our speakers. It is my great pleasure to introduce these two wonderful colleagues and friends. First, Kyle Reismandel is Senior University Lecturer at the Interim Director of Law, Technology and Culture Program in our Federated Department of History on the NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology side of the Federation. He is a cultural historian of cities, suburbs, media, and technology in recent American history. An accomplished and award-winning teacher, he offers a wide range of core and popular special topics courses for both undergraduate and graduate students. His numerous accolades include the Outstanding Teacher Award, the Excellence in Teaching Award, and the Albert Dorman Honors College Instructor of the Year Honor. Of course, he didn't include all of these things on his bio because he is that humble. His book, Neighborhood of Fear, The Suburban Crisis in American Culture, 1975 to 2001, has already been generating buzz since its release in late November. It has been named a Smithsonian Scholar's favorite book of 2020. Check it out, link in the chat. Now, Mary Rizzo is an assistant professor of history, American studies, and an affiliate faculty of African-American and African studies at Rutgers University, Newark. She works at the intersection of inclusive public history, digital humanities, urban studies, and 20th century US cultural history. She is the author of Come and Be Shocked, Baltimore Beyond John Waters and the Wire, and Class Act, Young Men and the Rise of Lifestyle. She is the founder of the Chicory Revitalization Project, which uses the Black community poetry magazine, Chicory, to encourage dialogue on place and identity. If I attempted to do justice to her body of work and the number of initiatives and public projects she's mounted, contributed to, or consulted on, we would not have enough time to get to the conversation. So let me just note that her public and digital humanities courses, she engages students in hands-on public history, work on issues including mass incarceration, immigration detention, police misconduct in Newark, social justice movements, and LGBTQ history. I encourage you all to check out the States of Incarceration site to see the work on immigration detention in New Jersey. And from the Rebellion to Review Board, Newark Fights for Police Accountability, a digital exhibit for which she won the Teaching Award for Excellence in Teaching History from the New Jersey Studies Academic Alliance. She's also on the advisory committee for the Queer Newark Oral History Project and so many other projects. <laughs> now for our current students and perhaps prospective students here in the space, thinking about a graduate degree in history, she'll be teaching a new hybrid course in the fall on black arts movement and cultural arts movement. Look out for that. And with that, I turn the virtual floor over to them with my many thanks. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for the that introduction, which I, I feel completely overwhelmed by um, and uh, for inviting us here today. Um, so Kyle and I had decided that we would each talk a little bit about our project separately, and then um, you know we're happy to have a, a take questions from the audience, um, and you know we have some questions for each other if people are shy or quiet. Um, so uh, Kyle, do you do you want to kick things off, or I'm happy to let you 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 take us on the way. <laughs> uh, sure, I'll kick us off. Right. Um, and again, thanks to Christina for organizing and also inviting us. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, that was also very nice of her. Um, so as Mary said, we talked a bit about sort of why are we here? <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, and how does this relate to our work? You know, thinking about history of the suburbs or the history of the city in relation to African American studies and also Black History Month. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about sort of what my book is about and then make some connections that we can maybe draw on more or have questions about. So my book is a cultural history of American suburbs from 1975 to 2001. And what I was trying to understand or get at is how did this later period of suburban history really differ from the sort of narratives we know about early post-war suburbs? Um, and if they were different, right, which sort of began with that question, um, how were they different? 
And so the essence of the argument is really sort of three things. Like one is that this is a new period of suburban history from the mid seventies on, and that it's defined by local dangers. And when I say local dangers, I mean threats that were in the neighborhood, right? This is why it's called neighborhood of fear. So rather than perhaps the threat of racial integration or of government through taxes, these are things like very toxic waste, kidnappers, burglars, um, satanic heavy metal, uh, occult board games or role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and so when I found that the, the, this culture was suffused with these local threats, uh, I found that suburbanites reacted uh, in, in some particular ways that actually extended their power. So rather than simply be victimized, uh, I called it product productive victimization. And the idea is in response, they're able to do a whole bunch of stuff they couldn't do before. So control space more effectively, including privatizing police functions, um, further centering the white suburban family at, at the center of talk about family values and the, and the nation's values. And this is all in context of the broader rightward turn in American culture and politics. So fueling and fueled by the Reagan revolution um, that's sort of happening throughout the 60s and 70s and comes to the fore in the 1980s and 90s. And so I think about my work as being in conversation with or about African-American history and related to our talk today, because one, constructing whiteness as a race, right? Not assuming it, it is somehow the norm against which things are defined, but rather it's defined in relationship to. So much of what my book is about is how white suburbia is defined, right? Through its fears and through its power. Uh, so for example, being able to surveil your own house or walk around your own neighborhood as a cop or neighborhood watchman, right? Is very different than the way in which black and brown people are policed in the inner city. So, so those kinds of contrasts I think are important about my book. Um, and then lastly, I sort of centering culture and thinking about culture is the other sort of part of our, our, our presentation, our conversation today, uh, and really centering representations and how representations help make sense of the world and facilitate these kinds of power um, or these other modes of domination. So I think in short, that's where I fit in. So I will turn it over to Mary to talk about Come and Be Shocked. Awesome. Thank you. And it's just, it's really, um, you know, it's wonderful to be able to have this conversation with Kyle. I mean, our books came out within a couple of months of each, of each other and, you know, we're, they're about different things, but they really overlap in a lot of interesting ways. So I think that um, having this conversation together will be great to see how people, how you guys who are attending pull out some threads um, uh, that I think bring these books that are otherwise, uh, you know, somewhat different together. Um, so, yeah, so let me let me tell you talk a little bit about my book, Come and Be Shocked, Baltimore Beyond John Waters and the Wire. I have to show off the cover because the press did such a beautiful job with it. So uh, what I'm looking at in this book is how um, cultural representations of the city of Baltimore have not only shaped um, how we understand what the city of Baltimore is, but how those representations were created through conflicts and battles between cultural producers and uh, policymakers, politicians, civic leaders, um, and particularly in a lot of cases, tourism folks in the city. So what I'm interested in is the uh, relationship between culture and policy. Um, and you know that uh, I think is um, is an interesting uh, approach because we often think of culture as separate from policy, unless it's policy that's specifically about culture. But one of the things that I talk about in the book is that often policies that don't seem to have anything to do with culture are um, affected by culture um, or are um, uh, represented within culture. So, for example, policies around housing discrimination in Baltimore, we see their effects in um, novels uh, like *The City of Anger* uh, from 1953 or a TV show that uh, was very popular in Baltimore, The Buddy Dean Show, which becomes the basis of John Waters' film, Hairspray. Um, so I'm interested in this relationship between culture and policy, and particularly in that battle over what the image of the city is, right? So who is Baltimore for? What does Baltimore mean? And um, these are this is a battle that is more than imaginary. And I think that that's something that I really want to emphasize, because a, a lot of times when we think about kind of a cultural studies approach um, or a cultural history approach, we, we, we think it may end with a sort of textual analysis, right? Thinking about the text of the film or the novel or whatever. Um, but what I argue is that there are material effects to these images, right? Um, so that material resources go into creating these images of the city and that there are material impacts of these images. And in the story that I tell in Baltimore, so I, I tell, I would say two stories in uh, two overarching stories in the book. 
there are lots of little stories, but two overarching stories, right? So the one of the overarching stories is the is the historical one. Um, so the book goes from about 1953 to the early 21st century, and this is a period in Baltimore's history where we see, like many cities, it goes from um, being having an industrial economy to uh, losing population to the suburbs, um, predominantly losing a white population, um, and the loss of that industrial economy. So we see a shift to uh, what we would call a post-industrial or service economy. Um, and one of the things that I, I uh, argue is that in trying to mitigate that those shifts, the city of Baltimore, particularly in the 1970s, followed the path of urban branding and using arts and culture as a tool of revitalization and renaissance, right? So if you're old enough, uh, like I am, you may remember in 1980, um, you know, Baltimore was renaissance, right? It was the uh, Time magazine said 1980 was this, the year the year of Baltimore. Um, and this was all around this revitalization through arts and culture, as well as through um, development like the Inner Harbor. So if you know anything about Baltimore, you might know the Inner Harbor. But what we see is that um, uh, the city, as a, a sort of part of its municipal policy, begins to really put uh, effort and uh, money and resources into particular kinds of representations of the city um, that are um, beneficial for it, right? So that may include things like wooing production companies to make films in Baltimore, for example, right? Um, that includes tourism campaigns like the Charm City campaign uh, in 1974. Um, so the idea is that, you know, they want to create an image of the city that's going to draw people to it. On the other hand, artists are uh, making their own images of the city. And we may think about somebody like John Waters, for example, who's making films starting in the late 1960s and um, into the early 70s, and obviously since then. Um, and his films are quite different. They offer a very different perspective of Baltimore that is much more uh, queer, um, much more filthy, he would say, um, and that is uh, not necessarily trying to woo tourists to come to Baltimore. So that's one part of the story that I tell is that sort of overarching historical narrative about the role of culture as part of the redevelopment of the city and why that matters. Um, the second part of the story is about race, right? And um, in Baltimore, because even today, Baltimore is still a city that is very much divided between African American and, and white uh, uh, people. Um, then we talk about race in Baltimore, we're talking about black and white. And what I argue is that when we look at the cultural representations of the city of Baltimore, what we see are two predominant images, one that I call Charm City, and the other is Bodymore. Uh, the Charm City image is what, you know, if you have in your in your mind an image of a John Waters character from Hairspray, that's a good image for Charm City. It's white, working class, eccentric people who are kind of quirky and funny and weird and a little bit off, but in a like non-threatening sort of way, right? Um, so Charm City becomes one way to think about a sort of, uh, of whiteness in Baltimore. And that is counterposed to Bodymore, which is um, the uh, predominantly image of Black Baltimore as uh, Black neighborhoods that are dangerous, that are um, uh, uh, crime ridden and um, are uh, places of potential death, right? And we can think of that image probably most powerfully coming through the TV show, The Wire which is, a, if you're not familiar with it, an HBO TV show about uh, police, homicide police in um, Baltimore and um, looking at, uh, uh, sorry, narcotics police in Baltimore and homicide police trying to deal with um, drug gangs in Baltimore. Um, so the reason why this is important is these two images of Charm City and Bodymore are defined in relation to each other, much like what Kyle was saying, right? It's like we can't understand what white suburbia is without the um, fear of the sort of uh, uh, black city. In Baltimore, we can see that happening split between neighborhoods so that the, there are the sort of white areas of Charm City, Baltimore, and then there are the Bodymore neighborhoods of Baltimore, and they are given a meaning in relationship to each other. Um, and the important thing, again, about that, there are a lot of important things, but one of the important things is about material resources, so that the production of the image of Charm City means that resources continue to flow to those areas of the city and away from um, the places that are more associated with Bodymore. So let me stop there, because uh, I think we've given you a lot already to think about. Um, so, so Kyle, did you have anything you wanted to jump in with, or should we see if there are questions? 
I do actually. Um, and so, and so one, as a former resident of Baltimore and perhaps part of this black white dynamic and living in a part of the city that was part of the Renaissance rather than part of uh, Bodymore, uh, I actually am reminded of something from your book and something we've talked about, which is the TV show Rock. Mm-hmm. Um, so for those who don't know, Rock was sort of about a working class family in Baltimore, black family starring Charles S. Dutton, who himself is a um, former felon, right? So yep. who has been released and now has moved into acting. And so there's this very interesting dynamic of that show that it is kind of in the Norman Lear mode of television, right? It's kind of realistic and funny, but not, you know, jokey funny, right? And it's intended, I think, to soften the image or to sort of present an alternative vision of Black Baltimore that is neither sort of even in definition or response to White Baltimore or to, you know, body more, right? So I'm curious how you make sense of it or whether that interpretation makes sense or how you would explain it perhaps in the, you know, in this idea, this broader idea of culture and policy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's great. Rock is one of my favorite. Uh, it's funny. It's a show that I watched when I was a kid, and it, it's um, it's kind of extraordinary to think about that, you know. And it wasn't on TV for very long. It was only, I believe, on for three seasons. And interestingly, I believe now it's on reruns on uh, TV sometimes. But I had to buy on the gray market somebody's burned DVDs in order to watch the series. Right? Wow. Like that. That's really interesting about you know sort of what yeah. TV shows because like The Wire, you can get like the nice box set and it's mm-hmm. streaming all over the place. Anyway, but Rock is a really interesting show, and 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 uh, it really is a um, um, the kind of brainchild of Dutton who wanted to offer a con a, a different image of the city in the, exactly the way that you're talking about, right? He, you know, Rock is a very um, uh, kind of nuanced portrayal of a black working class family. Um, and it does do the sitcom things, right? It has the sitcom beats. So it's not like he's like totally doing something experimental, but he's like, let's show a loving black family that is trying to make it work. And the the sort of villain in rock, you know, are the uh, drug dealers who start to move into the neighborhood and rock represents this real um, kind of civic leadership, right? So, um, and it's interesting because Rock overlaps with um, the um, uh, when Kurt Schmoke is mayor of Baltimore, and there's a real sort of overlap there in this kind of like a, a, a uplift mentality, right? Of like you know we do need to deal with these problems of of, of uh, drug use, violence, etc., um, but we can do it within the community and through um, uh, kind of uh, helping each other and with government help as well and rock was very like open about uh politics right they talk about like national elections on the show etc it's so it's really interesting and in the book i contrast it with um uh with the wire actually which i think is a very different version of black baltimore um and i think it is important that dutton is a black man who's from baltimore who's writing uh this story and that perspective i think is an important one so yeah no i i, I love rock it's such a great show i wish more people knew about it it falls into my category of why did i watch this when i was 12 right i liked 30 something what was there for me right but i do think it had this impact in the way you talk about it in the book and i think just how we make sense of things like this right so the reason culture and policy matter to each other is they make sense of each other one makes the other possible so right. And the idea of Rock being the sort of upstanding community member in the face of these pressures, right, of sort of lack of upward mobility or sort of feeling stuck, right, like a kind of Ralph Cramden character who's Black almost, right, and then the other side of it, which is I don't want my kids to be drug dealers or to be gunned down in the street because they live here, right, and this is all hilarious, Um, or this is at least played in some part for laughs that I, 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 it's always so fascinating to me that he his presence on the show in some ways is the show, right? Like mm-hmm. his characterization and like all the things you're talking about. Anyway, I, I didn't anticipate talking about rock this much, but I was really, I wanted to hear <laughs> you talk about it because I know the way in which it fits is, and I often say this to my class when I'm teaching urban history is, and, and I fall into this tendency myself, which is to tell stories of domination, right? Without yeah. resistance or without alternatives or without a vision that there is an alternative. Right. And I think part of the point of your book is this story is not this bifurcated story of like victims and, you know, Mm -hmm. dominators or something, right? But something different. It is actually about alternate visions that are foreclosed for a variety of reasons um, or that are incorporated into the Renaissance view, but aren't actually, the the, the access to the Renaissance doesn't doesn't really exist, right? right? Like like the actual Renaissance. Um, (laughs) 
Right. It's all about image. And what's what's interesting too, seeing, you know, how Baltimore uh, over the last few years has really doubled down on this idea of image as most important. So for people who have any, you know, have been keeping up with Baltimore, which is the reason why you necessarily would, but um, the last mayor had to resign in disgrace after this scandal. And one of the things she said in her like resignation was like, I'm sorry about what what I did, how it affected the image of Baltimore, which I thought was just so fascinating. It's like the image is paramount. It's like, it's not like what you did to the people of Baltimore first and foremost, it's what you did to the image of Baltimore that I think is really fascinating. Yeah, and it's like the pervasive politics today, right? Like, so Jersey City's campaign, the Make It Yours campaign, which is essentially saying, white people move to JC and make right. it yours, right? And the people were there like, it's already ours. Like we've right. already done that, right? right? And in fact, you can make it yours because we made it ours. So there's like a real conception of the city of as a brand. And I mean, this is, I think to the point about my book, it's part of this much yeah. bigger turn towards sort of the market and thinking of things through the marketplace rather than through social goods, right? So mm -hmm. if the image is good, at some point, the city will be good rather than right. the city should function and then people will move here. Right. I mean, it's like trickle down, right? It's like it's like the sort of trickle down version of, uh, of economics version of culture. But what could you talk? Well, there's a your new book. Yeah, there you go. No, nah, no, no. We have a question in the chat, too. So oh, I don't okay. know if you want to go to that or if you want to ask me a question. Well, let me ask um, you a question. And we'll let we'll let okay. um, we'll let more people jump into the chat. But um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that relationship between city and suburb. Right. Because obviously for your book, right, the, you know, you're focusing on the suburbs, but um, they're uh, defined right through their own relationship with the city historically. So um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about that and how they kind of construct each other? Yeah, and I think this is what a lot of people who are in suburban studies or think about this stuff struggle with is how often and in which way should suburbs be, a suburb as a category, be defined against the urban and then specific, you know, instances of case studies or whatever, um, you know, and, and a number of books sort of function this way, they're all very good, you know, so Robert Self's book about Oakland and Oakland suburbs or um, Atlanta and Atlanta suburbs in White Flight by Kevin Cruz, it, sort of do this work. But a part of what I was getting at and part of the animating question of the dissertation that became the book was, are they defined by something other than that? Or how are the way, what ways do suburbs define themselves through these behaviors, these representations, et cetera, or not define themselves, but they're being defined in these ways through culture and policy. And I think coming around to this idea of neighborhood of fear, the essence, like boiling it down to that idea is in some sense, a co-optation of urban politics, right? Uh, the language of civil rights and victimization that is legitimate, right? That you can make claims because you have been victimized or you see yourself in some way as legitimately victimized and then defining yourself by that victimization, right? That if it's ongoing, then I thus can, I have this, these kinds of powers, right? So again, I can do all these things on my streets that are not possible, right? In, uh, you know, West Baltimore or whatever, right? It, it, I have control, I have power, but it's premised on the fact that it could go away or it's being threatened by something, mm -hmm. right? And something that is seen as real. So teen suicide is really on the rise. So satanic panic is at some sense real. Mm -hmm. um, the, the case of Adam Walsh being kidnapped in the middle of the day in a shopping mall is a real thing that happens that right. animates these fears, right? So uh, I, I'm, I guess so, so part of what I'm saying is, is not quite in the realm of what we might say today about QAnon or something in, of conspiracy theory that really doesn't really operate even in the sort of uh, Richard Hofstetter sense of having a kernel of truth, right, to build from, um, you know, it, where, you know, fluoride or whatever it might be, the earlier conspiracies, um, but that it's animated by real fears, but that have these effects that go way beyond these fears, right, and that in the sense of relating to the city, so back to your original question, that continuing to patrol your neighborhood as if it is endangered by criminals promotes the idea of crime being prevalent, even when it is not, right? And we know that law and order politics, the war on crime, the war on drugs, all have these just devastating effects to cities and black and brown people, right? So even though in the, in the discourses of crime in the suburbs, they're not talking about black people, they're not talking about integration, they're not even really talking about race explicitly, mm -hmm. even though the implications for race are so devastating across you know, that entire period of time. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think there's a question. Uh, yeah. in chat I have so much cat hair on my glasses. <laughs> it's making me insane. <laughs> I, I totally understand that. Um, yeah, we're living that glamorous life as always. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's take a look at the, the uh, questions here. Um, I got, you want to read it out? You got a friend from high school who's shouting you out. So oh. that's nice. Um, so you have a question from Chelsea um, who asks, what uh, what made us both want to delve deeper into uh, Black history? Um, so 
I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I can start with that. Yeah, go know? for it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that one of the things that, um, that for me, you know, I began the project by being interested in Baltimore and wanting to, um, you know, think about this question of like, how do we understand a city, or right? how do we know what a city, how do we have an image in our head of a city that we've never been to, right? Which is certainly, um, I think, a very true thing, and um, Baltimore is a good place to do that, right? And um, Understanding, of course, that Baltimore, as I said, demographically, it has been and is still to this day pretty split uh, black and white. And it's a majority black city, um, but it is a predominantly African-American city, um, although that's changing now as it is in many cities, but still is uh, a predominantly African-American city. So that you know necessitated right like right there that necessitated uh, my thinking about about black history. But more importantly than that is that when I started this project, you know, the um, very the easy route for me, right, would have been to think about you know, David Simon, who's the creator of The Wire and Homicide, to think about John Waters, right, who um, makes films like Hairspray and Female Trouble and Pink Flamingos, uh, Barry Levinson, uh, who did like Diner, Tin Men, you know, uh, Avalon, Ann Tyler, the novelist, who did The Accidental Tourist and a million other books, Laura Lipman, who does mystery novels, right? I, those are the sort of obvious people and they're all white, right? And I think they're the obvious people because they're the people who have the most access to the um, uh, to Hollywood, to HBO, to big publishers, right? So they're they're the most visible people, and those their visibility matters, right? Because they are the ones who are have a lot of power in determining what the image of Baltimore is. And I could have written a book just about that, and that would have been a book about. And the whiteness is a definitely a, a theme in the book. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to do, and I started out, was to challenge that a little bit and to say, like, there are unquestionably representations of Baltimore that were created by black cultural producers, right? How do I find those? And what do those tell us that we don't see in the other ones? Now, I mean, I don't wanna make it sound like there are no famous black cultural producers or artists that come out of Baltimore. Obviously that's not true. You know, the, the, the one that maybe is most famous um, at the moment is Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, who grew up in Baltimore and whose um, The Beautiful Struggle talks about growing up in Baltimore as the son of a former Black Panther, um, Paul Coates. Anyway, um, but I think what, what, so what that challenged me to do though is to try to think about like, okay, why, why were these other images that were created by Black Baltimoreans not getting the attention, right? And what happens when we also take those seriously as images of the city and put them in conversation with the um, more famous ones. So, you know, uh, go back to rock because apparently this whole conversation is about rock. You know, again, in that chapter, I put rock and the wire in conversation with each other, right? Um, so what, is the, what, is it, what does it mean when we see these representations of black Baltimore by a black creator versus a white creator? And it gets at the, uh, the last thing you said was what I was thinking of all along is that the kind of segregated nature of, of culture, right? That like popular culture or cultural products operate in different marketplaces, right? That like, there are a million, you know, rappers mm -hmm. from Baltimore that you don't know because you are not that person from that place, right? I do think in some sense, being white historians studying black places, there are, you have to confront that more explicitly, I think, in sort of the way you said of mm -hmm. like, why don't I know about Chicory? Like, why is this a thing that seems to be so vibrant, so interesting, so relevant to the exact things that are going on in that moment? And yet, you, you know, it's really not visible, at least in the archive, as it was visible to the people at the time. And I think reconstructing that is so important to it, right? That, and, it, and it's to some degree why when I study culture, think about culture as the center, right? Meaning cultural representations at the center is, this is what people encounter every day, right? This is what they file through, think about, or you know, consume in some way. And that, that is structuring their view of the world, even if it's not a one-to-one -one relationship or whatever. Right. And that I think, too, just sorry, real quick, this is, yeah. uh, you know, I think that that's probably the, uh, for me, one of the trickiest things about doing the work that we've done in our books, right, is that it's not a one to one relationship, right? So how do we think about right. the effect of culture on, you know, to be really lofty on consciousness, right? On, uh, and how do we, yeah, exactly, right? How do we, how do we make those claims, right? So that, that yeah, as, yeah. Uh, as, as historians is tricky, because we can't, you know, we're not, I mean, I'll speak for myself, I'm not like a cultural theorist, right, where I'm just like, going to like 
let my thoughts just kind of go and see where the, everything right. ends up. You know, I, I need to have some evidence for the stuff that I say. Um, and I think you feel the same way that you have evidence for what you say too. So I think that that's like a challenge for those of you who are out there who are, uh, you know, attending this, who are, are uh, thinking about kind of like doing scholarly work in this mm -hmm. field. I mean, I think that's like probably the trickiest thing, but I'm sorry, I interrupted your- No, no, no. I, I was going to say a similar thing of, you know, we, we talked a lot about like, where should we pitch this, right? Who's going to be here? And yeah. at some level we're like, well, we could talk a lot about method, right? How we do our work and right. why we ask these questions. So I think you addressed that really well for people who might be interested in that. Uh, I was gonna go to the chat. So yeah. um, so my uh, NJIT alum, Sarah Femi, um, so do you both find that this relationship between the two communities is found throughout the entire United States, parentheses, where the atmosphere of the white neighborhood is influenced by its fear? This is an excellent question. It is, it's both about what I found and also about the method, right? So generally speaking, I would say people who study space or are or, or part of city and suburb or environment work through case studies, right? That like, if I can prove or think about this thing in one place, I can sort of extrapolate some bigger thing, right? So the urban crisis, right? So we need Detroit, we understand it, okay, or white flight, we now know Atlanta. And I felt with suburbs that that wouldn't yield the kind of answers about the function of the category and how people make sense of themselves um, through culture in the same way. So Sarah, to your point, culture is not all the time everywhere for everybody, right? So that's why it can change. That's why there's resistance, right? But I do think that part of what I, part of the balance of writing the book in the way that I did was trying to highlight places that were diverse geographically and to some sense diverse by class, right, relatively speaking, so that you could capture what is at the center of this definition, what seems to hold together people who think of themselves this way or live in places they think of as suburbs, right? So, you know, my friend Cameron, who, who wrote the blurb of my book, right, he said, you know, the idea of suburbs as psychological terrain, right? And I think that's such a useful way. Um, he said it very late before I could put it in the book and use it and pretend he didn't think of it. Um, but that idea, I think, is a useful one for thinking about this because case studies do a bunch of really good things, but they're not always useful for getting to these bigger questions about, like, what is the urban or something, right? And mm -hmm. often those are not doable projects for books, right? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say case studies aren't worthwhile, you shouldn't do them, right? Very clearly yours is, but I think it's about the question you ask and how you approach them. Um, and in this case, I think I really wanted to understand the category of the idea as it was enacted and sort of thought about rather than does, you know, Montclair, New Jersey, for example, where Charles Dutton now lives, which is fascinating. <laughs> Guys, thanks for tuning in to Rock Talk. Um, <laughs> Our new podcast. Rock in, Talk. in an hour or two, we're going to be talking about season two, episode five. Uh, Sarah, just chime in the chat if that answered your question or not, or if you have a follow-up. Um, and I will throw it back to Mary, who I think is monitoring. Uh, yeah, so actually we have a, a, a few other questions in the chat. So uh, Ryan has a, a question for, for you, Kyle. What's the relationship between suburban fear and conservative political mobilization in the 70s and 80s? And you've touched on that a little bit, but yeah, let's go into that a little bit deeper. Yeah, and, that, and in many ways, that's the primary question that's, that people are investigating and have investigated very recently, you know, recently being the last 20 years, because that's how long it takes um, to do this work. So I think it's a couple things, right? You don't get productive victimization without a truly successful conservative political movement and, and successful in sort of the sense of electoral politics of being uh, part and parcel of elections and debates about issues, right? So moving the conversation about crime to punishment and retribution, not to sort of solving social issues or whatever. Um, they need that structure around them to be able to think in these ways about controlling space or regulating people. And it's a similar thing on the sort of cultural side or the social conservative side of without the rise of family values politics in the Christian right, it's not as easy for parents in the 80s or 90s to see heavy metal, goth culture, Marilyn Manson as an existential threat, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we see there's various moral panics throughout throughout history, but also throughout American culture. Um, and they always have to, they have to be existential, right? For them to matter in any real way. Uh, and so by the late 70s, it's the continuing rhetoric of the Christian right is the, the family has failed, right? That the triumph of gay rights and feminism and all of these things means families no longer function in this way that they should to create you know, self-disciplining citizens, and et cetera. So without that, right, without that framework, without thinking of the world that way, or even being able to access it, right? Even if you yourself, right, are a religious or Jewish or whatever, you're able to see the world through that lens and understand what they're saying about why you're afraid your son's going to turn on the car and shut the garage door while listening to ACDC, right? That this is like a real existential threat to your family that you can act on in, in, in all these ways. So they need each other and they don't happen without each other, I guess would be my answer, Ryan, if I had to boil it down to two sentences. 
one of the things that I love, which no one asked me to do, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Take take the rest of the until we start talking about rocket. No, one of the things that I love about about your book, Kyle, is uh, beyond the scholarly, is um, how much it reflects my own life. Right, growing up in the suburbs in New Jersey, and I know I've told you this before, but when I was a kid, I don't remember the exact year, but there was a cartoon a Saturday morning cartoon uh, Dungeons and Dragons show. Oh and yeah, I, yeah. My mother wouldn't let me watch it because she was afraid not. I was going to like commit suicide or whatever. So you know, these were real. Like, I mean, these were actually truly real fears that people had that, you know, look so ridiculous in the rear view mirror, right? Yeah. In a way that I think like, hopefully, you know, in 20 years, we'll look back at, you know, QAnon and be like, how could anybody believe? I mean, I think that now, I don't know how anybody believes <laughs> it now, but, you know, right, I mean, right. it's, it's, it's really, it's kind of extraordinary. I say it to my students all the time that part of our job as historians is to figure out why something was common sense that is clearly not common sense, right? Like how do, why does, why would this make sense to someone? exactly uh you are you gonna read the next one you want me to read it oh uh, go ahead you can you can uh i think some people are maybe messaging not everybody so i next one i see is from isabella uh so it says has there been evidence or signs of gentrification in and the return of white folks to urban spaces uh, or oh sorry I'm, uh, emphasis all wrong on that has there been evidence or signs of gentrification in and the return of friends oh geez chat move guys come on gary uh, and the return of white folks to urban spaces affect the relationship between urban and suburban spaces. Yeah, so gentrification and the re-entry or the back to the city movement, fun city, I think is, is yeah. what this question is about, what that has to do with race. Go. Yeah, I'll take it because I mean, I think, you know, it's super important to the process that I'm talking about, right? So when we, you know, so I think the turning point in my book is the election of William Donald Schaefer, mayor of Baltimore in 1971. Um, and, you know, this is, goes back to an earlier question, like that's a, obviously a very specific Baltimore thing, right? William Donald Schaefer was mayor of Baltimore, but he was representative of a trend of mayors in big cities around the country that, you know, we would have started in the 60s with Lindsay in New York, but then continued um, in in other cities around the country as well. So it's not just Baltimore, but in my book, Schaefer is the turning point because he's the one who really begins to see, he, he, he becomes mayor at the city as like, as it's going into like a low ebb, right? It's lost a lot of population. It's uh, manufacturing plants, factories are shutting down, moving to the South, moving overseas, right? There's, um, and to go back to the kind of conservative uh, political aspect of this, Schaefer is a Democrat, but um, as the nation is moving towards a more conservative uh, politics, that means cities are getting less funding, right? They're being left to hang out to dry. So, you know, these are all these things are coming together, right? As Schaefer is um, mayor. And he is the one who really has this vision that Baltimore can attract people to return to the city, whether as tourists or as upwardly mobile new residents of the city. And like, there are these great letters that I found in his archives of like his like um, aides and stuff who are like, what, he's crazy person. Like who is gonna live, who's gonna come to Baltimore for a vacation? Like, it, it's like beyond their capacity to imagine, right? But Schaefer does make it happen. And, um, the the so the reason why this is important of course is that that ties directly into the gentrification question right so what um, you know, Schaefer is essentially doing is trying to create a, a sort of pathway for gentrification right he wants particular kinds of people to come to Baltimore as tourists, as business, uh, as employees of corporations, um, and as new residents. And uh, one of the things that didn't get into the book that I'm really fascinated by is the dollar house program in Baltimore in the 70s or the urban homesteading program. And this was a program that was in a lot of cities around the country, but Baltimore was one of the first. And basically they, you know, the city would sell you uh, a house for a dollar if you um, agreed to rehab it and live there for a certain period of time. Um, but of course the rehabbing process costs money. So what this means is you get middle class people who are bored with the suburbs, right? Because there is a real anti-suburban sort of move um, in the 70s and of course continuing since then. Um, and so they, they want to come back to the city or they want to come to the city because it seems more authentic and real and it has this sort of vibe to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think gentrification is definitely a key part of this. Um, in that really and in that relationship between urban and suburban spaces. And that's definitely the argument Suleiman Azma makes in his book about Brownstone Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Is that part of the part of the return is not actually a return, right? It's people born in the suburbs 
who right. are returning to some version of their history, right? That they're mm -hmm. trying to connect with the authenticity of their Italian grandma or their great grandfather exactly. or something, right? That, that that is somehow more real and lived, right? Because of the implications of race and ethnicity that make things more gritty and real, right? But without all the messy actual stuff. <laughs> well, and also because I think that the suburbs, I mean, you know, obviously this isn't true, but the suburbs seem like they don't have a history, right? right? Exactly. You know, so it's like the suburbs are placeless. Mm -hmm. You know, the Levittown, everything looks the same, but a city seems like, you know, there is a real story there that has like people that the suburbs just, uh, you know, don't seem to have. Yeah, and it's being sold to them, right? Like I think your point about William Donald Schaefer and that the revolution in sort of progressive urban mayors of both parties of selling the idea of the city as whatever it is, right, uh, is about attracting those people, even even attracting them not to live there, right? That I think part of the they would consider the success is that it is a tourist destination, not a place to live. They don't really care about replacing population; they care about replacing tax dollars and sort of you know, uh, uh, re reproducing the, the losses of deindustrialization if, if, as if that was possible, um, which does eventually require sort of real estate. Right. Uh, there were a couple things. Uh, Gary said, uh, the D&D &D scare was real for me growing up in Indiana. We had to hide friends D&D &D books so their parents wouldn't destroy them. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of the things I tried to find, I didn't find much evidence of, but continues to be a story people tell is, um, the burning of books and CDs and albums and the running over of albums and CDs. Uh, there's not a lot of mainstream news coverage of it that I could find, although I suspect that if you got into like newspapers.com or something for local papers, you'd see more of that. For anybody who's interested in doing that research, please do. <laughs> uh, looks like we've got a, a comment from Zachary uh, says, Oh, Zach, hey, you both focus on the process of defining these spaces through the construction of a certain image, but as we draw closer to the current day, would you say that the process of image creation has been affected? Does the presence of social media allow for more alternative narratives to gain traction? Or would you say it more so further reinforces prevailing narratives? I know it's about 20 years too early to say for sure, though. I mean, <laughs> we've got enough to talk about rock. We might be here for 20 years, so mm. we'll come back. No, I mean, Kyle, <laughs> Use wanna... that rock org. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm very skeptical of arguments that begin with the premise because of social media and not because post social media isn't different or in some way a different media, but right that somehow its effect will be different than the structures that structure the effects of other things, right? Like of Chicory Magazine or of, uh, you know, the early internet or the BBS or something, right? That I think maybe, so I don't know. I, I have a hard time answering that in any way that I think is satisfying, Zach. Um, but I think I think one of the ways you might see is to study whether it does work the way other media work or not, um, in terms of these things of, you know, our uh, medical or environmental metaphors we use all the time for it. So things going viral or, you know, that it does that language actually sh shape and is it different than sort of what Gary was talking about where people might talk about this in the local news or it might be a phone call or it might be a chain letter, right? Like these are all these are all popular ways to spread urban myths, right? That like these things happened in much the same way, but because they're not digital all the time or, or as accessible in quite the global way, we think of them as different. But I actually, I suspected it's scalable rather than a difference of degree that rather than kind. I mean, I, I would say that I, I agree in essence that the sort of structures remain the same, right? So that, you know, I think, for example, of uh, uh, Donald Trump tweeting, um, you know, a year or whatever ago about how Baltimore is a rat infested mess and, uh, you know, Elijah Cummings should focus on his dis district in Baltimore, right? And, 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 you know, Trump then was playing into long standing imagery of black Baltimore, right? So he's using social media to just emphasize, right, the same kinds of tropes that we've heard a million times before about a city like Baltimore, right? But also about a city like Newark or a city like Philadelphia or Gary, Indiana or whatever. Um, I, I do think, though, that there is a potentiality it's not just with social media, but a potentiality with um, like even like YouTube or um, uh, other kinds of sites that allow for the uh, democratization of artistic production, right? Which is mm. not to say that it's totally free, but you can go on YouTube and watch like filmmakers in Baltimore who don't have access to Hollywood money, put their movies up, right? Um, 
you can go on Instagram and see young writers in Baltimore who are sharing their poetry. Now it's akin to, you know, I think what Kyle's saying is true. It's akin to the, the way that people would have done it 40 years ago um, in terms of like mimeograph machines and handing stuff around, right? But um, uh, the scale of course is quite different and, and then the reach is, is different. So I do think there's an interesting uh, potentiality there for people to get different messages out a little bit more, but it is still hard to drown out the powerful messages, which are like, you know, the ones that are still coming from corporate sources and from, um, you know, government sources. And I would even say like music might be the one place where that is more true because yeah. the obsolescence of record labels, right, as a, or like major, like that being the gateway into an industry, right, has truly democratized music, right, it has made it more fair to artists, it has me meant that particularly Black artists are now paid for their work in a way because they control it. So that actually, I think, is structurally different because of the internet as opposed to maybe some of these other things. Yeah. Um, just real quick, there was a question that came up a while ago in the chat that I'll, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just like, because this person's been waiting for a while. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think I didn't, I don't think it came to me. That's why I didn't. Yeah. No. So there, uh, so someone asked uh, whether I was able to interview black and white folks uh, to get a sense of how they view Baltimore uh, differently. So that's a great question. And I'll be honest with you, for this book project, I did not do a lot of interviews. I did some but I did not do um, a ton of interviews for this, in part because I wanted people's work to speak for themselves, right? Um, and so I, I, I wouldn't say that I, I did any kind of like comprehensive interviewing to get a sense of that, but certainly the historical sources do suggest, um, you know, different uh, relationships to the city and to place um, based on race. And that's also about based on where people live. And I think one of the things that I haven't mentioned, I don't think yet, that's really important in understanding Baltimore is Baltimore is a hyper segregated city to this day. And Baltimore is the place that um, invented residential segregation in uh, 1910, passed a law that very clearly stipulated where black and white people could live in the city. And that law was then struck down as unconstitutional when it was adopted by a different state and a different city um, a couple of years later. But I, I think that that's important because, because Baltimore is so segregated, right? When artists are writing about East Baltimore, when they're writing about Hamden, right? That means they're either writing about a black neighborhood or a white neighborhood. And it's, it's, it's very rarely a kind of nuanced picture of both. So it's interesting the way that that segregation kind of replicates itself in the cultural representation. Thank you, Christina. I, I don't use Zoom for class, so I don't, I don't have it all down for the Q&A part. Yeah. Um, so Jordan said, Kyle, you mentioned the urban crisis and some of the quote unquote classic works that have explored it. Can either of you talk more about why taking a cultural history approach can produce something different than these now canonical studies to focus more on disinvestment, unrest, housing policy, et cetera? So part of it is just generational. Um, I think the people who wrote those books are probably 10 to 15 years older than us. <laughs> and we're trained in these kind of, I would say, classic methods or sort of disciplinary methods around economic history or political history, et cetera. So, so I, and I wasn't trying to cast aspersions or shade on their work um, or that it doesn't do well what it's attempting to do. But I do think that those stories are not there around representations, right? That, um, where do television shows, comic books fit into 1950s Detroit, right? When people, when, with white citizens councils, you know, they're trying to indoctrinate children. They're trying to get them to think in these um, segregated, racialized ways. I doubt it's only at the dinner table, right? So there's a study there and there's probably a book out that I don't know about or something too, but I, I think it does get at how people are able to make sense of something that doesn't make sense to us and reproduce it, right? Why it continues as an investment, both literal, right? economic investment, but, you know, the investment in your racial identity, the investment in your neighborhood, um, and the investment in your sort of power over this space and these people in this way that might otherwise be torn down through some other cultural moment or educational moment or whatever. You know, this like Susan Douglas makes the argument that radio contributed to the civil rights movement because white suburban kids were listening to Black music and DJs pretend to be black on the air, right? Or she says it's possible. I shouldn't say she makes the argument. <laughs> I'm dubious, but you know, like, but I, but I think it, it gets at the question that's being asked by Jordan, which is like, it, we should we should ask that question. Like, what what was the role of these, you know, whatever it might be, mass media, et cetera? 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree. And I guess what I would say, too, to Jordan's question is that, you know, um, is that writing about culture doesn't mean that we are also not writing about unrest, housing, disinvestment, etc. Right. Um, I think that those earlier urban studies folks um, who I, I think, you know, we both build our work on. Right. You know, we, we see what they did and, and absolutely makes it possible. Right. For us to do the work that we're doing, because they did such careful, um, amazing uh, archivally driven work, right? But my, I guess my critique of, of those folks is that they don't take seriously enough the role of culture, even though, as I, you can see in a place like Baltimore, the people who run the city of Baltimore take culture seriously, right? They create whole agencies of government to deal with culture, right? So if the people who are running the cities think it's important, Right then, um, I think it it is also then worth our um, time and effort as scholars to think about what role does it actually play in the way that people think about a place um, and in shaping, as Kyle said very eloquently, right, shaping our consciousness around our identities, ourselves, our our communities, and so on. So yeah, I mean, I would say that it's 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 a both and, you know what I mean? Like we are talking about all of those things too, and adding another layer that is, you know, deeply human, right? We understand the world through culture. So that it makes sense for us to think about that too. And I think for people who are doing, who are studying, who are students who are thinking about doing this kind of research or work as public historians or whatever, it's kind of like what's at the center of your work, right? So it, those things are all in there, right? Like it's ragu, but it's, you know, we have to know, like it's, you know, we're looking at the tomatoes rather than the, the onions, right? So we're like really thinking about these representations and stories versus thinking about like, you know, David Freund's book is like massively researched in these bank archives and mortgage archives. And it's just like, it's an amazing feat of just organization, right? Uh, to, yeah. But then to analyze and understand all these bank instruments and things, which are totally helpful in understanding how segregation happened, right? But that's just what's at the center, right? He doesn't need to go like, what did Rock think? So, you know, or he could, but it would just feel like a, an aside. It wouldn't feel as central to the, the purpose of the book. Yeah. I'm not gonna let Rock go, you know that, right? <laughs> Forever and ever and always. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna say one more thing. I, Sue, I, uh, from high school, I just saw, I didn't have the Q&A open. So, hi, good to see you. <laughs> or do, I guess for you to see me, question mark. <laughs> I um, hope you're well. <laughs> uh, so in the chat, let me see. Uh, so uh, Avram uh, mentions about the Inner Harbor mm. as a, uh, describes it as a pathway to bring the suburbs to the city. It's a mall, absolutely Harbor Place is definitely a mall. Essentially it's semi-independent stores under the Rouse Corporation, later was too expensive and basically all chains. Absolutely, <laughs> right? So, you know, and I think what one of the things that's fascinating to me about studying cities is how uh, uh, cities keep making the same mistakes over and over again, right? So it's like, you know, the Inner Harbor is, is opened in 1980, or Harbor Place is opened in 1980 as the sort of centerpiece of the Inner Harbor, Baltimore's Renaissance, you know, um, now today it's like, you know, basically fallen on hard times. Times, right, it's not uh, doing the 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 work that it had done, you know, 40 years earlier, um, and yet we see other places, <clears throat> New Jersey, opening giant malls as if this is a New York, as if this is the way to get people to come to your city or state or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there's this like this is weird. Like, uh, what do they say about insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over, <laughs> right. expecting different results. And I just feel like that is something that we see in cities all the time. And I think Abram's point is well taken that part of the argument about gentrification is it is in some sense suburbanization of the city, right? That it provides mm -hmm. a version of safety, of comfort, of consumerism that wasn't there before with the exterior of, right. you know, the urban experience, right? Whatever that might mean, right? Of Williamsburg or whatever in Brooklyn. And that's actually, you're right. That is why the Inner Harbor has failed, right? It like overcommitted to what they thought people wanted, right? It was a, right. and it's kind of like Trump's version of the suburbs, right? It's just like, it's, it's, so, it's so antiquated as to not even get a response of like, we're not defending that or care about it. Like it's not even on our radar as an idea or something we care about. So right. why would I need the inner Harbor to have right? The biggest cheesecake factory. Like <laughs> I have the cheesecake factory. It is so close. Right. And it's exactly the effing same, right? Like it right. doesn't make any difference that it's in Baltimore. Right, right. Well, and, and, what, and we don't have to get too in the weeds on this, but that is the sort of the brilliant thing that that, you know, James Rouse did with the festival marketplace idea mm -hmm. is to give it the veneer of being different, of being unique. And I do truly remember being in college and my uh, roommate in college being like, oh, yeah, my boyfriend and I are going to go down to Baltimore for the weekend or whatever. And, and me being like, 
really huh it's like oh yeah the inner harbor it's so cool there's this mall i'm like you grew up in paramus like why do you care about a mall but the capital anyway, of malls yeah exactly exactly but you know i mean but um but what, what they were able to do and it was successful at the time was to create that veneer of something different but familiar enough that it's not scary it's not so scary that you're not going to go um i think there's a whole other story here too about how scary is also attractive um yeah. and the sort of fascination piece of it but you know i don't we probably don't have time to get into into that no, but i think it speaks directly to like what i'm writing about my book is the people who who yeah. raise in that environment seek out actual fear right like i've been yeah. told to be afraid of ozzy osbourne but i should really be afraid of omar right like you know it's just like there's this right and I think you're right. It, it is this it is this draw, right, of what of desire and fear that are always sort of wrapped up together, especially with these visions of urban crisis, right? It goes back to, and again, when I say visions, I truly mean the the newspaper television yeah. version of urban crisis, which is buildings on fire, throwing bricks, national guard, right? It's just like it's it is very boiled down right. uh, and allows suburbanites to sort of dehumanize people in the city, so they can then return, right, in this exact way. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. That was a good answer. <laughs> Do we have more uh, questions? Let's see. Yes. I was trying I, to figure I, out if Jim one was saying we're a good show or Rock was a good show. I was. He, he refuses to come down on either side, so we'll we'll leave it to a department meeting. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. We'll duke it out there. Um, I, I will just mention that Avram followed up in the oh. uh, in the Q and A and just uh, mentioned that Baltimore had redlining longer than any other city. Black and Jewish buyers were not allowed to buy in certain areas and relegated were relegated to certain areas. This also affected the character of the city uh, uh, today. And then he notes um, the wonderful book, which I will uh, definitely mm. also give a big thumbs up to Not In My Neighborhood by Antero Piatila, who it was a super honor for me to have my book blurbed by because um, he's done an amazing, his book, Not In My Neighborhood. If you're interested in Baltimore and housing discrimination in particular, his book is kind of like the text on it and it's very readable. He's a, he's a trained as a journalist, so he's a, a very readable writer as well. Yeah, that, that that's an important thing. I already have an Amazon review that says too many run on sentences. so. I can't disagree in the part they're talking about. Um, oh, but that does remind me very quickly, Christine, before you close us out. And Jim, I feel like I forced you to say that now. So I don't know how to feel about it. All right. It. I don't care. I'll take a forced compliment. <laughs> yeah, it's pandemic. Um, but the idea of not my neighborhood and sort of what I talk about in my book of the, the history of NIMBYism, right? Of like that phrase being leveraged yeah. to do this kind of spatial work, right? It is, it has suburban origins in that way, but it is actually like a, as much a class sort of articulation as anything else, right? That gets used in space to do stuff. So, uh, so if anybody's interested in NIMBYism or has a question about that, you know, feel free to chime in. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. that. Seems to be one of the two things that people usually want to talk about. So, mm, that's really interesting. But his yeah. book reminded me of that because I because I, I read it when I was working on this and for that purpose a million years ago. Yeah, it's such a good book. <laughs> Others oh, chance. Well, well, with that, we'll do a last call for any questions or comments. And while we give everyone an opportunity to post any last thing, oh, applause. Yes. Oh, thank you Thanks, so guys. much. It's coming thank in. Coming. So, yes, thank you for being such an incredible audience. Yeah. We are appreciate each and every one of you, especially when there are five other events happening at the exact same time. Uh, you know, so, and for being so engaged. I want to just mention two quick things if I can. I put in the chat if you're on socials, please follow follow us at RUNFM and Federated History. Follow Mary on Twitter. She puts a lot of engaging things there. A lot of cats. Tweets at Rico <laughs> underscore public history. And the Chicory Revitalization Project is on Instagram that brings a lot of the yeah. archival images and original works from Chicory right up to the fore. I don't know if Kyle wants to put his accused wizard out in the yeah, chat. Yeah, please. He didn't send that to me. <laughs> Look, so it's, been, it's been a long semester. <laughs> Uh, two quick mentions again is that this is programming part of FAM Week. And for more information about the other events that we have happening, please visit sasn.rutgers.edu forward slash FAM Week. And have to shout out these two very important events tonight. The Research with a Heart and Art Front Galleries with the Queer Narc Oral History Project is debuting Neutral Nation, a virtual art exhibit and experience in honor of National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. It opens tonight. 
It's a three-day event, which includes artistic offerings, a panel discussion, and special exhibits. Our Queer Nork History Project is on Friday night at 7 p.m., and it features an interview with our other incredible colleague, Timothy Stewart Winter, mm -hmm. co-director of the project, and Aaron Frazier, a poet and writer living with the virus for over three decades. So for more information about all of these events and what they have to offer, please check out the link in the chat and go ahead and register. Again, we start tonight and I cannot close any event without mentioning this Saturday at 9.30 a.m. It's virtual, but it is gonna be no less special. The Clement A. Price Institute will be mounting the 41st annual Marion Thompson Wright Lecture. Um, one begins again, organizing an historical imagination. It'll be moderated by historian Barbara Ransby mm -hmm. and features prominent organizers like Alicia Garza, Bill Fletcher, and Kara Page. For more information on that and, and to RSVP, please visit their website, also coming in the chat right now, because it's already over 800 people registered. So we wanna make sure <laughs> you're able to get in into the main space, but it will be streamed live as well. Last but not least, if you missed some of our other past event, like the awesomely engaging conversation about In Search of the Color Purple with Salome Shatilla and Ardeen, oh, yeah. Jacqueline Mattis, or How It Feels to Be Free with our Ruth Feldstein and Naomi mm -hmm. Extra, head to our YouTube channel. I'm gonna pop that link in the chat. I know I bombarded you with a lot of information in a very short time, and for that, I am grateful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wrap. So have a good, safe day. Thank you again so much for, for joining us. We're going to let Miss Diana Ross play us out. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Great you. job, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's my house and I live here. There's a welcome at the door. Let them turn their cameras on now so we can all and dance. If you come on in. <laughs>